Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this short game video, we're going to be discussing and analyzing tech news, which, as usual, has popped up over the past 24 or so hours. We're going to be starting things out with Brendan Gregg, who is a Netflix engineer who has conducted a series of micro benchmarks to analyze the performance impact of Meltdown on Linux. The end result, well, it looks like up to a 6% performance impact, so we'll get into that in just a second. Then we'll move over to a series of Canon-like SKUs from Intel, which has been listed. These are 10 nm parts. Then we'll move over to the Intel Core i9-8950HK, which is the first, the debut, i9 processor for mobile. And finally, we'll finish off with NVIDIA and Turing. Yep. This one is a graphics card architecture supposedly aimed at consumers, so no Ampere it appears, but we'll get to that in a minute. As I said, first things first, Meltdown. So Meltdown has been... interesting? That's probably putting it mildly. I know some people uh, I know who are managing servers or whatever are pretty much losing their hair over this thing, but... You know, for the rest of the world who perhaps don't have such a vested interest in, it's, interest in the whole situation, it's, it's been very um, curious to see how it all unfolds. A friend of mine actually sent me over a link, which is what Netflix engineer Brendan Gregg has been working on. So what this does is it analyzes with a benchmark the Linux kernel page table isolation patches. And this analyzes just a single of the four fixes that have been created. So there are four. Uh, they are guest kernel KPTI patches, the Intel microcode update, the cloud provider hypervisor changes for cloud guests, and then ret -poline compiler changes. Now the benchmarks he's created, once again, I'm going to echo this one more time just so we're 100% abundantly clear. This is just for one of those fixes. I'll link his a blog post in the description of this video because it's well worth checking out particularly if you work in a cloud environment however with his testing he has uh, decided to assess five particular criteria the first is syscall rate these are overheads relative to the syscall rate although high rates are needed for this to be notable he says that his particular uh, employer, which once again is Netflix, high rates are unusual in cloud with some exceptions, primarily if databases are being hammered. There's context switches, these add overheads similar to syscall rates, and I, I'm using a verbatim quote from him, and I think the context switch rate can simply be added to the syscall rate for the following estimations. Page fault rate adds a lot more overhead as well for high rates. Working set data, hot data, more than 10 megabit, beg, megabytes, excuse me, will cost additional overhead due to TLB flushing. This can turn a 1% overhead, syscall cycles alone into a 7%. And finally, cache access patterns, the overheads are exacerbated by certain access patterns that switch from caching as well to caching a little less well. Worst case, this can add an additional 10% overhead, taking, say, 7% overhead to 17% overhead. Now, the alarming way to look at this is that the KPTI patches, according to him, can create an overhead which is absolutely mind-boggling. It can be anything from 1%, which is, eh, that's fine, to 8,000, sorry, to 800%, which would probably cause you to jump off of a cliff. But practically speaking, in real-world scenarios, he believes that the performance difference is going to be between 0.1% and 6%. But with additional tuning, he believes he can probably squeeze it to under 2%. Now, once again, these numbers are still early. Unfortunately, not only is he still doing testing and tweaking, but, well, the entire industry is trying to do much the same. Even the... Um, Various distributors of Linux kernels are still trying to tweak things. Obviously, Microsoft are trying to tweak things, and that's not even counting Intel themselves. Regardless, no matter how you slice this, it's not good. It's quite disastrous from a PR standpoint from, for Intel. This, of course, at a time where a lot of companies are starting to already think, well, Epic looks kind of a, a big deal, and don't forget that Meltdown does not affect Epic. Yes, Spectre does, but only, well, one variant, and it's very difficult to get working in real-world scenarios anyway. And I guess the take-home message here is that while Brendan's work is very impressive, he's certainly been very thorough, his work with Netflix does not necessarily equate to 
what all companies are going to be experiencing. Some are going to be getting hit much harder, others considerably less hard. It really comes down to the workloads that are being put onto that particular system. And ultimately, perhaps the winner here, in the long run, is going to be Intel for trying to upsell you or sell you to the next generation of processors, and perhaps even AMD, who, in the short term anyway, will certainly get a lot of brownie points from companies who just simply want an upgrade now. They can't wait, they just need to purchase new hardware, and perhaps if they can do that, if they can sell people, or well, sorry, uh, conglomerates, large numbers of processors, epic processors, well that just simply means that a company in two years time and they perhaps want to upgrade again, after all, it's not like they're just going to upgrade once, this is going to be a product cycle of constant upgrades to keep up with HPC and other uh, demands from their own customers. Perhaps I'll keep AMD in mind and said, hey, you know what, Epic served us really well, we didn't have any performance issues with it, it was stable, uh, there was excellent reliability, so let's buy from them again. From a more negative piece of Intel news to a more positive piece of Intel news, and that is Intel have announced the new 8th generation Core i3 processor, which is based upon the Canon Lake architecture. Now, I'll say this right out the gate. This is not necessarily a high-end processor, but it is a processor which is going to be a low of power and, at least in theory, find its way into an awful lot of low-power devices. The i3-8130 is a two-core, four-thread device which runs at 2.2 GHz for the base, boosts up to 3.4 GHz for megabytes of level 3, and comes with or without an integrated graphics chip. You'll notice that it says Canon Lake U 2 plus 2 or 2 plus uh, 0. So this indicates that it has a updated iGPU or the other option would be no internal graphics solutions at all. Of course that does raise an awful lot of questions like why this part actually exists. In theory it could simply be that Intel are trying to leverage the fact that well, maybe they're not getting excellent yields yet on the 10 and M process. Obviously, that's just a theory on my part, and Intel would need to confirm that, and I highly doubt they would. In which case, of course, it would most likely be um, tied in with some discrete graphic solution. Okay, so from one mobile processor on the low end of the spectrum to a very high end processor in the mobile spectrum, and that is the Intel Core i9-8950HK which is a 6-core, 12-thread device. Now, as a very slight side, I really don't like the naming conventions for an awful lot of mobile versus desktop parts. I think it creates confusion for users. That's my personal opinion. Now, I do realize that when it comes to i7s and i9s and all that jazz, it's really kind of an indicator to say, hey, this is higher up on the performance echelon. And from the low end of the mobile spectrum, we're going to go to the very high end on the mobile spectrum, and that is the Intel Core i9-8950HK, which is the first i9 part for mobile. Now, this thing is a 6-core, 12-thread part, so you're going to be getting an awful lot of performance. Now, murmurs about this actually emerged back late last year, I believe November, and it was actually ADA64, and ADA64 was a pretty excellent way to find out leaks about upcoming processors because change logs typically start to appear and what we did see back then is uh, developers added identification support for the i9-8000H. So other rumours which we're starting to now uh, fill in in terms of certainty are details on clock speeds and this part is very impressive. The base clock is running at 2.9 GHz whereas the turbo can run up to 4.8. Um, and then we have the website videocards.com who have managed to snag a 3D Mark image which shows off the processor. Now I'm going to get this right out of the way because I feel that it's pretty obvious so I might as well just say it up front. This is not going to be a cheap processor. In fact, with this particular notebook they're running a dual configuration of a GTX 1080. So there's two GTX 1080s in here running an SLI. So let's just be totally honest, you're going to be looking at a laptop which is most likely north of over 2000 US dollars. Obviously we're going to need to wait for benchmarks and it's also going to depend upon the rest of the configuration of the system, for example memory clock speeds and that kind of jazz, but if you were to just look at this as kind of a an overall rough uh, 
guesstimate, if you will, of performance is probably going to be competing roughly around the Core i7-8700K, which is very impressive. It essentially means that you would have a mobile version of the desktop 7370 and i7-8700K processor, which means an awful lot of processing power for a mobile chip which is running at just 45 watts plus. And considering the fact that this is overclockable, although obviously your your mileage will vary in, in a uh, mobile form, after all, it's not like you can have a huge cooling solution, so you're going to have to have a, uh, a more modest cooling solution than, say, a full desktop system. But even so, even if you can just get a couple of extra 100 megahertz out of this thing, it's still very impressive. Okay, now let's discuss NVIDIA's Turing. So, for those who have been following along with NVIDIA's roadmap for a while, you may be aware that currently we're on Pascal, which is the GTX 10 series, as you're probably aware. Volta was released, but that's for HPC, high performance, in other words, the data centers and those type of environments, and certainly has not yet found its way to the home unless you count the Titan V, which is still prohibitively expensive for most individuals. Now, there's a rumor that's popped up on routers, and it tells us that there will be a new consumer-focused graphics chip released from NVIDIA next month, and this is going to be known as Turing. So, is this true, or is it true that we're instead going to get Ampere, or is both of these rumors uh, completely and utterly false? Well, it's worth noting that Turing does not necessarily mean that Ampere is off the table in terms of code names. For example, Turing could be the name of the actual graphics chip itself. Therefore, Ampere could be the name of the either architecture or the actual SKU. I did release an article about this a few days ago. I'll link it in the video description. But the brief synopsis is there's a few different options regardless of whether it's Turing or whether we're going to be seeing um, Ampere for the consumer lineup and its relationship to Volta. <clears throat> the first is that it is Volta, but there's just a few tweaks here and there that essentially means that perhaps it has the FP performance pared down, perhaps it has a high bandwidth memory to removed, other such changes as well. The second is that they're not actually the same architecture at all. You could almost think of them as siblings, perhaps there's some changes which NVIDIA just felt would be good for both architectures, so they added it to, let's say, for the sake of argument, Turing, just to continue with the naming conventions of this video anyway, but ultimately the two architectures are quite different. The last theory is that Turing is not anything to do with Volta, it's not even a relationship to Volta, it's more akin to a, a refresh, refresh excuse me, of Pascal. I'm not 100% convinced about that yet. I feel if it was a respin of um, the Pascal architecture, they'd probably get raked over the coals, so therefore it would make more sense for them to not refresh it. It would be, make more sense for them to release an entirely new architecture. I don't feel that it is a uh, refresh of Pascal. Instead, I feel it is a completely different architecture. Ultimately, with Volta out and consumers expecting higher performance, I don't think that a simple die shrink at this point with perhaps maybe a little bit of extra memory bandwidth for maybe a slightly higher clock speed would be enough to tempt people who have a really good graphics card, say for the sake of argument, you've got a GTX 1080 or something. If someone was to say, well, hey, you could buy this GTX 2080 and it's got 15% extra performance, it's not going to tempt current users. It probably would tempt people who currently have, let's say, a GTX 980 or perhaps a... Uh, a R9 390 or something like that, perhaps those individuals would invest, but it certainly wouldn't be enough to pry the GTX 1080 away from someone. Uh, but let's face it, if it was a Volta architecture based uh, GPU, so in other words, let's say Turing is a brother, if you will, of Volta, then perhaps that would be enough to tempt someone to actually cough up the money. It's kind of a weird time in the in the GPU market, and I, I have a theory, and it's probably going to be proven wrong within about 0.3 seconds of someone actually getting it, but I wouldn't be surprised if the floating point performance and other few changes in the architecture, in, sorry, in, on the actual architecture itself, 
would perhaps negate mining performance a little bit. The only reason I feel that that might be the case is NVIDIA have said strongly that they want to get GPUs to customers. They want the GeForce lineup of cards to be for customers. I personally feel, and this is uh, um, once again another comment from NVIDIA, that they feel that the cryptocurrency market is not a stable market for GPUs. They, they instead feel that it's better to get the GPU in hands of gamers because gamers ultimately will always buy graphics chips. It's like they feel it's a stable market because displays are always going to become uh, increasingly more demanding. For example, 4K displays are becoming more the norm now, higher refresh rate displays. You've got games which are now displaying in HDR, VR headsets, and you've got games, of course, which are becoming increasingly abundant with textures, with high-resolution um, artwork in general. For example, you know, you've got uh, increasingly impressive shadow detail and HBAO and whatever else, which is very demanding on the GPU, plus high levels of geometry, and while I could keep going about this, you could kind of get where I'm going with it. Ultimately, gamers always want the best quality visuals they can. Therefore, gamers are very likely to continuously buy new GPUs. And with the PC market thriving at the moment, it's booming. After all, look at the release date of the PlayStation 4. It's almost five years old now. It really, you know, at the end of this year, it's going to be five years old. It's already four and a half, roughly. So that's pretty old for an architecture. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if we start hearing rumors about the PS5 at some point. So developers can feel that they can go all out now with PC versions of games, especially with the Xbox One X and the PS4 Pro as well. So they feel they could almost go down the stack. They can release a version for the PC, they can release a version for the Xbox One X and the PS4 Pro, then the PS4, then the base model, uh, then the base model Xbox. So I wouldn't be surprised if NVIDIA do perhaps cripple the GPU slightly for cryptocurrency so that instead it can be at the hands of game so in the hands of gamers but ultimately that's just a theory. Anyway, I am going to be uh up skedaddling, excuse me. You can tell I'm kind of struggling to record this one. Unfortunately, my sinuses are still a bit up in the air. They're certainly considerably better than what they were a few days ago. Um the antibiotics are doing absolutely wonders for my uh, for my uh, energy levels i have to say that uh, for a while there i actually had a really bad toothache at the same time as an ear pain and as well in my head and it's all th thanks to sinus problems and now it seems to be mostly gone so hopefully within the next couple of days or so i'll be back to producing videos as normal which is good because i have a press event that i'm attending on thursday so I've only got a couple of days to feel well for that, and I'm kind of looking forward to it. That's the follow-up to Developing Beyond that we've covered previously. This is where the winners are going to be selected. And I've got a couple of interviews as well that I needed to reschedule because I've been sick. So, hopefully everything's good and dandy. Anyway, with all that said, hopefully you've enjoyed the video. I'll see you soon. Take care. Bye for now.